I think we're good. All right. Welcome, everyone. It's 11 o'clock. We are going to get started. Um, we are, it's our Monday forms day. So we are digging into our car forms library um, to cover some more forms. Again, during this um, first quarter of 2024, most of our forms have to do with the residential purchase agreement. So they're all kind of offshoots of that. Um, today, we are covering the seller counter offer, the seller multiple counter offer, which is basically the same as the seller counter offer with one small change, the buyer counter offer, the buyer backup offer addendum and the modification of terms form. So those are kind of what's on our plate for today. As always, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand there in Zoom land. Um, you can just unmute yourself and interrupt me or you can throw it in the chat box. I have the chat box open. Um, all those different ways work. I never counted as rude if you interrupt me to ask a question. So feel free to do so. Um, other than that, we are gonna go ahead and get started. So thanks for joining us today. We're going to start with the seller counter offer. Um, so that's what you should be able to see on the screen. So a seller counter offer is in the case that you've submitted an offer to the seller or you're a seller and you've received one offer that you want to counter. So we're only countering one offer. And what that means, right, is that if we counter that offer and they accept our counter, we're officially in contract. We have no way to get out of that contract unless we cancel it or withdraw the counter offer. So just kind of know that's how this counter offer form is used. The number at the top should be sequential. So it starts with one seller counter offer number two, seller counter offer number three. It works like that as you go back and forth and play ping pong with that buyer counter offer. You're gonna put a date in the upper um, right hand side of that seller counter offer. If you double click, it will put today's date in there. So oftentimes that's gonna go there. And most of the time our counter offer starts with counter offer number one. Um, counter offer number one should be in reference to the purchase agreement. Um, if it's seller counter offer number two, it's probably going to reference the buyer counter offer. And then you'd put in what number of buyer counter offer goes there. Or it could be in reference to another form there. And then we're going to put the date of that form that we're referencing um, in that next line. Usually, like if it's a purchase agreement, it's going to be the printed date on the first page of the residential purchase agreement on the top of that left hand side of that first page. You're gonna put in the full property address here, property address, trying not to get in trouble with um, YouTube and get the videos pulled. So buyer number one, that's where you're gonna put your buyer's name, the buyer number, or the, that's where you put the buyer's name because if you're filling this out, you're the seller. And then you're also gonna put in your seller's names here. Okay, so then that's how you fill out the top section. The terms of the counter offer, the terms and conditions of the above reference document are acceptable, are accepted subject to the following. So we're in this one, we're referencing the purchase agreement. That's what the default is. So we're referencing the purchase agreement and saying, hey, all the terms in that purchase agreement are agreeable except what I'm noting below. So it's unnecessary on your counter offer to put all other terms remain the same because we've already said that in the printed language up here on number one. Um, 1A, the liquidated damage and arbitration of disputes paragraph in the offer each require initials by all parties. If either of those paragraphs is not initialed by all parties, that paragraph is excluded from the final agreement unless spe specifically referenced for inclusion in paragraph 1D of this or another counter offer or addendum. So really, truly, um, you're probably going to kick back to kind of compliance. If I submit an offer, somebody submits an offer, buyer signs that liquidated damage and arbitration of disputes. Seller doesn't want to sign it. Um, we just usually need to address that in a counter offer that the seller does not agree to the liquidated damages and arbitration clause. And it would be the seller and buyer don't agree to that because we need to all be in agreement on that. So just kind of keep that in mind, um, especially if the buyers have signed it first. Unless otherwise agreed or altered in another counter offer, the down payment and loan amounts will be adjusted in the same proportion as in the original offer, but the dollar amount of any initial and increased deposit and seller credit shall remain unchanged from the original offer. So it's stating here in our counter offer that, hey, if we said we were putting 20% down on the purchase price and we're countering on purchase price, um, it's still 20% down. So those are going to be increased. Now, if we said we're going to put 1% of a deposit down, you know, we fill in that deposit amount and it calculates it out to 1%. 
that doesn't change. Okay, that's going to remain the same as with seller credit. So if we were thinking, gosh, we need 2% in seller credits, we put in seller to credit, you know, $10,000 for a $500,000 purchase, that's going to remain the same as well. So you may need to counter to adjust those numbers if you wanted them adjusted. But otherwise, those stay the same loan amount down payment automatically adjust. Um, the other section here is going to address the appraisal line on the on the original offer, unless otherwise agreed or altered in another counter offer. If in the original offer, such as paragraph three L two of the RPA, <coughs> the appraisal contingency amount is lower than the original offered price. Right. So on, um, you know, I don't know why I don't pull the RPA in every time I do these classes because I always want to reference it. So let's um, search, hold on, RPA. It should be in here. California Residential Purchase Agreement. Let me pull this up in here. I'll just show you where that's referencing. All right, hold on. I'm just going to show you where this is referencing in the contract so that it makes sense to everybody. Because if you're a newer agent, you're going to be like, I've never seen that before. All right. Hold on. I'm just scrolling down to get into the grid. We're looking for L, section L here. Okay, um, L2 says appraisal right here. We have the option on the residential purchase agreement where we can say, hey, there's an appraisal contingency or there's no appraisal contingency. We also have the ability right here at the beginning of that grid to say, hey, the appraisal contingency is based on the appraised value at the minimum of the purchase price. Okay, we're saying, hey, the appraisal contingency is based on purchase price. Or here we can fill in a number. So let's say the purchase price was 500,000. We could say, hey, as long as this appraises Four hundred and ninety thousand. We're good to go. That's saying that hey, my buyers are willing to pay a gap of ten thousand dollars from the purchase price to the appraised value. Okay, we're not seeing this come into play very often right now in this current market. But when the market goes crazy, seller's market, we're seeing this a lot more often. We're writing offers above asking. We're going in with multiple offer situations, and our buyers are saying, hey. We're willing to pay, like if that property doesn't appraise, we're willing to pay that $10,000 difference. Why is that important? Because if your loan is financed or if your purchase is financed, the lender is gonna base that loan amount on either the purchase price or the appraised value, whichever's lower, okay? So if our purchase price is 500,000 and it appraises at 480,000, your loan amount of 80%, because our example was we were putting 20% down, is going to be based on 480,000, not 500,000. That means we're going to have a gap of down payment that we need to come in with the difference of if we can't renegotiate the appraised value. So that's where this line comes into play. If you're just saying, hey, it's contingent on the property appraising at the appraised value, we don't fill anything in there. But let's say that we filled 480,000 in here. And then we're doing the counter offer. That's where this is going to come into play. So that's why I wanted to show you where that was at in the offer. We're going to hop back up to the set counter offer. And then right here on C, it says, um, such as paragraph 3L2 of the RPA, the appraisal contingency is lower than the original offered price, right? In that example, we said, hey, the offer was going to be $500,000. We're offering four eighty dollars or four ninety dollars there on that appraisal contingency. The dollar amount of any difference, that appraisal gap, shall remain unchanged and be deducted from the final contract price to create the final appraisal contingency amount. Then it gives us an example. For example, if the purchase price in the offer is $1 million and the buyer reduces the appraisal contingency value to $950,000, that's what they filled in in that line there where it talks about the appraisal contingency, the appraisal gap is $50,000. If the purchase price is increased to 1.2 as a result of this counter offer, the appraisal contingency value shall be adjusted to 1.15 or 1.2 minus 50,000. If the property appraises below 1.15, buyer may exercise the appraisal contingency right to cancel this agreement. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So A, B, and C says, hey, um, well, sorry with one, one says, hey, all other terms that aren't mentioned here, stay the same in the contract. Okay, we're agreeing to everything else that we don't address here in this counter offer. B is saying, hey, liquidated damage and arbitration clause needs to be agreed to by everybody or excluded. 
C is, hey, in the counter offer, um, if the appraisal contingency amount, oh, sorry, B is also, I think I skipped B. B is um, the down payment amount is going to automatically adjust and stay at the same percentage of down payment to loan amount. The good faith deposit stays the same and the amount of seller credits stay the same. No automatically adjusting there on section B. C is the appraisal gap that's going to automatically adjust by the dollar amount. Okay, so those are all things that we don't have to address as part of this counter offer. Do we have any questions um, so far up until line D? All right. Perfect. Thank you, Bree. All right. D is where you get to spell out any terms in that offer that you want to counter on. Maybe you want to counter on who the NHD provider is, or maybe you want to counter on the purchase price or the close of escrow dates or the contingency timeframes. Any of those items can be done here. Just so you know, I like to be really specific when I fill out my counter offers. So if I'm going to fill out like a change in the contingency, the inspection contingency, I'm going to put RPA. I'm going to go back and look at the RPA. Hold on. We're going to go forms. We're going to hop down here to the residential purchase agreement. I'm going to find the item in this section. So here we have the investigation of property. Maybe we want all the contingencies from L1 to, or from L3 to L7 changed. Um, that's going to be 3L3. So just kind of keep that in mind for a minute here. We're going to go 3L3 and 3L7, seller counter offer. I'm going to put RPA 3L3 through 7 contingency time frames to be 10 days, right? So I'm going to reference in the RPA where that line item is addressed in the RPA. So if there's no questions as to what it is that I'm referring to, I like to be specific in my counter offers. I like it when other agents are specific when countering me so that I don't have to question what it is that they're meaning in that counter offer. Okay, you can reference any item there. That's how you do it. If you um, go on and we go like RPA item two, RPA, oops, RPA item three, RPA item, right? If we go off this list here and we keep going down, it's going to automatically add for us a text overflow addendum. I can't spell RPA today and talk at the same time. So, um, so if you go too low where it goes off the line, don't worry if it vanishes, it's going to magically appear on a text overflow addendum. So just know that it'll still be there. If we want to see what that is, we just click on that box. It'll pop back up. So it's not gone forever. I promise. Okay. If we want to incorporate something into our counter offer, we would do that in section E here. The following attached documents are incorporated into the seller counter offer when signed and delivered by both parties. If both parties do not sign and deliver the attached addendum, then any acceptance of the seller counter offer is not valid. So what does that mean? If I, the seller, am countering the buyers and I say, hey, we're including the seller license to remain in possession after the close of escrow. Okay, notice number one, it added that form to this for me already. So if I scroll down here, it's now added that form in. But what this line item means is that, hey, if I said I want to include this as part of my counter offer, and then the buyers accept my counter offer, but they don't return that SIP form, that seller in possession form, it's actually not a valid acceptance. Okay, you have to return both the counter offer and that SIP form signed for the buyer to have fully accepted this counter offer. Okay, so we can include addendums, backup offer addendum, seller to remain in possession, seller's purchase of replacement property, tenant occupied forms, residential lease, seller intent to exchange or other. So you have so many options there of things that you could include. Okay, so lots of things to be mentioned there. Any questions so far on um, up to section E? All right, fabulous. Section two, so that covers section one. Those are the terms of which we can counter the offer. And again, anything can be countered. We're not limited to the purchase agreement. So if they count, if they submitted an offer to us with a 
um, a, let's see, a uh, contingency for sale of buyer's property, a COP form. And we don't like the terms on that COP form. We can reference it right here. We can just, instead of the RPA, it'd be COP item three or whatever item it was. And then we would update the terms. Oops. Put in terms that are agreeable. Okay. So anything can go there. Um, the other thing that you may want to clarify, oftentimes like um, an addendum would be used to clarify. So let's say in that original offer, maybe they misspelled the seller's names or didn't have the seller put on there correctly. You could include an addendum. We would call it addendum number one. And on that addendum, we would just put um, seller's legal names are and then put the seller's names on there. Um, that would be the correct way to do it. You could do it as part of the counter offer, but it's not really a term that can be agreed to or not agreed to by a buyer, which is why we would generally do it on an addendum versus just part of the counter offer. We're clarifying the seller's names. It just is the facts of the transaction, not something that can be agreed to or not agreed to. Okay. Section two is the expiration. The seller counter offer shall be deemed revoked in the deposits. If any shall be returned, um, keep in mind that most of the time we're not collecting deposits ahead of time in other states, other areas. It's common practice for them to, with they submit the offer and the deposit at the same time. So somebody's holding that deposit. We don't generally submit the deposit until the offer is accepted. So that doesn't normally come into play, but um, it's deemed revoked um, by 5 p.m. on the third day after the date the seller counter offer is signed in paragraph four. Okay, paragraph four is the seller signing it. So you've got three days till 5 p.m. to either accept this form or decide you don't want to move forward. Keep in mind that any time during that time period, the seller could withdraw the offer. Okay. If more than one signature, then by the last signature date. So if seller one signs today and seller two signs tomorrow, I've got three days from tomorrow. Okay, you can alter that date and time right here on these blanks on line item 2A. You can, I combined line item and made it line them. But anyways, line item 2A, you can change the date and the time for which it um, expires. So you could shorten that time frame or lengthen it. Okay. Um, and for it to be valid, right, and deemed um, a uh, accepted. It has to be signed in paragraph five by the buyer and a signed copy of the seller counter offer is delivered to seller or seller's authorized agent. So in order for this to be not considered revoked um, by that expiration date, the buyer has to sign it and it needs to be returned back to the seller or the seller's agent. Okay. Those two things have to happen in order for it to be valid by the expiration date. If the seller withdraws the counter offer anytime prior to buyer's acceptance by communicating withdrawal to buyer or buyer's agent, that's car form W-O-O -O, may be used. It says may be used because you can do a verbal withdrawal. I usually do a verbal withdrawal and then I follow it up with the form for confirmation. Or if the seller accepts another offer prior to buyer's acceptance of the seller counter offer. Okay, so if seller decides to move forward with another offer, um, before we return the signed counter offer back, then it's deemed revoked or expired. Okay, so those are the conditions in which it would be revoked or expired or the conditions in which it would be considered accepted. Just so you know, if you are a seller, you accept another offer prior to them sending the seller signed counter offer back to you. Um, I would absolutely immediately reach out to that other agent and let them know that you've decided to move forward with another offer. And then I would still give them the withdrawal of offer just to make it crystal clear and that there's no questions about it. So that's section two, the expiration. Um, section three is marketing to other buyers. The seller has the right to continue to offer the property for sale. Seller has the right to accept any other offer received prior to acceptance of this counter offer by buyer as specified in 2A and 5. In such event, seller is advised to withdraw the seller counter offer before accepting the other offer. Okay, right, as I just communicated. Section four is the offer. Seller makes this counter offer on the terms above and acknowledges receipt of a copy. By making this counter offer, any previous offer or counter offer can no longer be accepted. The terms and conditions of these documents are incorporated into the seller counter offer unless otherwise agreed. Seller signs there. 
Um, section five is where the buyer makes a decision. So seller signs it, we give that to the buyer, hopefully with the signed residential purchase agreement with the little box check that we are countering that offer. Um, buyer I or we accept the above seller counter offer if checked subject to the attached buyer counter offer and acknowledge a receipt or copy. So if the buyers are going to counter this offer, they're still going to sign it that, hey, we agree to all these terms, except and then they're going to address those in the attached buyer counter offer. We're going to check this box here if they're countering. OK, and then we're going to put the number in here. OK, any questions on that seller counter offer? All right, fabulous. Then we're gonna go on to the next form, which is the seller multiple counter offer, very similar to the seller counter offer. So I'm not gonna go through it line by line. The top looks exactly the same. Here, you're gonna put counter offer number one. Just so you know, if we are countering multiple offers, this gets used in a case where we've had multiple offers submitted and our seller says, hey, we don't just wanna counter one offer or we don't just want to accept one offer, we want to counter, and we want to counter two or three of those offers. There's no limit. You can counter all the offers received. You can counter two of the offers received. It really makes no difference. You just can't use this form if you're only sending out one counter offer, okay? Um, so top is different only because it has a name. If we're sending multiple counter offers out, if we're sending three counter offers out at the same time, they still all get counter offer number one because in that transaction, it would sequentially be number one. However, the buyer's names are going to change, okay? So oftentimes what I do here is in your forms library for the seller multiple counter offer. Hit add, we're gonna go forms library, we're gonna go SMCO, oops, SMCO. See, there's multiple counter offers here. I would pull one multiple counter offer in per buyer that we're countering. So even though this one says counter offer number one, this one says number two, at the top, it's still gonna say number one and then I would fill in the other buyer's names. That way I don't accidentally mess up the terms, okay? So I would have one multiple counter offer in my transaction for each buyer that I'm, cancel or that I'm uh, countering. Okay, this top section here, one, all the way down to E, exactly the same as the seller counter offer. Um, three is the expiration, which was section two in the regular counter offer. Marketing to other buyers was three, it's now four. And the um, item five here would have been number four on the previous one. So they've added number two, which is the binding effect. The seller is making this counter offer to other is making counter multiple counter offers to other prospective buyers on terms that may or may not be the same as in this multiple counter offer, right? We don't have to counter the same thing. This multiple counter offer does not bind the seller and the buyer unless all of the following occur in the time specified below. Seller signs in paragraph five, that's the original signature from the seller. Buyer signs in paragraph seven, that's the buyer saying, hey, we accept this multiple counter offer. And then the seller has to sign again in paragraph eight, and the buyer receives a copy of the multiple counter offer with all of the signatures. Um, note, prior to the completion of all the foregoing, buyer and seller shall have no duties or obligations for the purchase or sale of the property. Okay, there is no obligation until all three signatures are on this document and it's been returned. The expiration of the seller multiple counter offer, again, that's the same as section two in the, the regular counter offer. It's three days um, after the signature below in section five. Um, we can change that and shorten that time frame or lengthen it as well as the, the time being 5 p.m. Okay, oftentimes, just so you guys know, as a seller counter offer, I really think it's kind of like, bad etiquette to give a buyer less than 24 hours to respond. I don't like as a seller to have less than 24 hours to respond to somebody. And I do the same to my buyers. I usually give them at least 24 hours. Um, you can do whatever you want. I just think it's better etiquette to give them 24 hours. Um, let's see, marketing to other buyers. Again, that's the same. The offer, seller makes this multiple counter offer on the terms and acknowledges receipt of a copy by making this counter offer. Any previous offer or counter offer can no longer be accepted. Seller signs there. Six is the buyers. 
buyer's acceptance of this multiple counter offer shall be deemed revoked, 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 and the deposit, if any, shall be returned. Now, this is a little different. In the previous one, the seller just had the or the buyer just had the option to to either accept the offer or to counter the offer. And if they accepted the offer, you were automatically in contract. With this one, if the buyers accept this multiple counter offer, you are not automatically in contract. So there's an extra expiration date here under the buyer's signature. Um, if any shall be returned to the buyer unless by 5 p.m. on the fourth day after the seller signs in paragraph five. So notice this isn't contingent on the buyer's signature, it's contingent on the seller's signature. And why is that? Because the seller, regardless when the buyer signs, the seller has three days to collect all the multiple counter offers back before making a decision. So the default is the fourth day after the seller's signature. This original expiration defaults to the third day after the seller's signature. So this is saying, hey, sellers took all the time, buyer sent this back to them. Now they get an additional 24 hours to make their final decision. Okay. Um, if more than one seller, then the last date, and you can change that time frame right here. You can tweak it with either the date or the time, shorten it, lengthen it, change the time. It is signed in paragraph eight by seller, right? So it's deemed revoked unless by the deadline. It's signed in paragraph eight by the seller. And the copy of this multiple counter offer is signed by the seller in paragraph eight is also personally received by the buyer or the buyer's agent who is authorized to receive it. So we also have to not just sign it, but we have to return it, okay? So that's section six is outlining that expiration of the buyer's response. And then seven is looks very similar to the acceptance line in the regular counter offer. Buyer accepts the multiple counter offer above. We can check this box if we want to counter that offer. And then we would put the number there and acknowledges and receipt of a copy. You can counter a multiple counter offer. You know, in the case that they counter on price, maybe you're afraid that yours not isn't going to be the best. So you might counter just a little bit higher or a little better terms or whatever that might be to get yours accepted versus somebody else's. Because we know the sellers sending this out to multiple buyers, the terms might be different. So we don't know. We want to have conversations with the other agents. Okay, buyers are going to sign here. Then section eight doesn't get signed until it's signed originally by the seller and then by the buyer or we, and then the seller gets to make a decision. Now, if the seller attaches or the buyer attaches a counter offer here, then we no longer use section eight. If we're gonna move forward with these buyers, we're just gonna accept the buyer counter offer. Okay, if the buyer accepts this multiple counter offer as written, they say, hey, we accept it, we sign. Then it's not valid until this paragraph gets filled out and signed. Okay, section eight. Um, selection of accepted multiple counter offer. Note to seller, do not sign this box until after the buyer signs in paragraph seven. Do not sign this box if the seller multiple counter offer is subject to an attached counter offer. So only if the buyer signs no counter offer and then our seller is going to move forward with this buyer then the sellers sign right here under line A. Let's say that two counter offers got returned and the sellers were like, man, we're gonna move forward with that other one, but we wanna keep this one in the backup position. Then we could check this box here that, hey, the seller accepts the seller multiple counter offer in backup position number one. The backup offer addendum car form BUO dated today's date is going to be attached. And then the seller's gonna sign here instead of line A. So if we're signing B, don't sign A, okay? The seller multiple counter offer in backup position shall be deemed revoked and deposits shall be returned to the buyer unless by 5 p.m. on the third day after the date seller signed in paragraph 8B, if more than one seller than the last date or by blank date at blank time, we can always tweak it. The seller multiple counter offer in backup position is signed by buyer below and attached BUO is signed by buyer and copies of them are personally received by the seller or seller's authorized agent. And then <coughs> the buyer would sign here. Okay, so just because we're saying, hey, we're accepting your offer, we're putting you in backup position number one or two or three. That doesn't mean that the buyer is going to agree to that. So we only agree to it. The buyer signs here and then they're going to ret uh, return that backup offer addendum form. 
Does anybody have questions about the multiple counter offer? You can also, if you don't have any questions, you can give me a little thumbs up under your reactions on your Zoom so that you're interacting with me. That works as well. Um, but we're going to move on to the backup offer addendum. Thank you, Bree. The backup offer addendum first, and then we're going to cycle back to the buyer counter offer. So remember here, we've got the seller accepted the multiple counter offer in backup position. Thank you, Shauna. Number one. So here we're going to skip over to that backup offer addendum. Okay. The uh, addendum to the purchase agreement or blank. So if we were submitting this backup offer addendum with our offer, we knew they already had an offer in place, but we're like, hey, we want you to have to go with us. If that offer falls through, that's where we would utilize this backup offer addendum or the seller countering it would also trigger it. So it's either going to be in reference to the purchase agreement or the counter offer. So if it was in reference to the seller multiple counter offer, we can just put counter offer number one here. I'm surprised it doesn't specify it, but you still have the option, or it could be to another form. Here's where we're going to put that date on the um, multiple counter offer form. Property address, we're going to put the buyer's names and the seller's names in the top, just like any other form. The agreement is in backup position number. You could have like three backup offers in place or five or seven. However many offers you had, you could put them all in a line. I don't recommend it um, if we're in like multiple offer situations, like the market's hot and buzzing, there's no reason to lock somebody into a backup offer position where we could put that property back on the market if it fell out of contract and get five more offers in and maybe even drive the price higher. So it's not necessarily important. Places where this would come into handy is when the market's not so hot. We wanna make sure that we lock a buyer in, um, in that backup position. We can use it as leverage for an existing buyer right? So it's all strategic on the listing agent side that, hey, we've got a buyer backup position. So if you are going to ask for $7,000 in repairs, we're just going to go for it with the other buyer, <laughs> right? So we can use it as incentive. We could also use it, maybe our sellers are in contract on the purchase of a replacement property. We want to make sure we lock in somebody in that backup offer position so that if the first buyer backs out, we've got somebody we can throw right in without having to put that property back on the market and continue moving forward, right? So there's a couple different ways that you can utilize this form. The agreement is in backup position number one and is contingent upon a written cancellation of any prior contracts and related escrows, prior transaction between seller and other buyers and mutual release of the obligation to buy, sell, or exchange that property. Seller and other buyers may mutually agree to modify or amend the terms of the prior transaction. So just because we have a backup offer in place doesn't mean we can't negotiate on that first offer. We can negotiate that first offer with those first buyers as much as we want to to try to save that transaction. Okay, cancellation rights for buyer. Buyer may cancel the agreement in writing at any time before seller provides buyer copies of written cancellations and releases of prior transactions signed by all parties to those contracts. So the buyer, even though we're saying, hey, we're locking you in as number one, the buyer can cancel at any time, okay? For buyer and seller, if the seller is unable to provide such written signed cancellations and releases to buyers by blank date, then either party may cancel the agreement in writing. So maybe we're like, hey, we're accepting this other offer, but their contingencies are 10 days. So by day number 11, let's see, it's seven, eight, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. We're going to go with March 1st. So, hey, if we haven't provided you copies of the cancellation by March 1st, you may want to go like, hey, you know, if we provided them a notice to perform so we could cancel that contract on day 10, then we may need to wait until like Monday the 4th to give you cancellation, right? So just kind of think that ahead, think about that before you put in a date there. This is what's going to give the seller the right to cancel. And just because the buyer or the seller has the right to cancel doesn't mean they're going to, Okay. Buyer's deposit shall be delivered to escrow holder within three days after copies of the written cancellation and releases signed by all parties to the prior transaction are provided. So we're saying, hey, the deposit's not due until we are moving forward with you as the buyer. The other option is here, or if checked, shall immediately be handled as provided in the agreement. So if we check this box, their deposit's going to be due to escrow today. 
Okay, otherwise it's gonna default to whenever the other um, buyer cancels and we provide copies of those cancellations. Four is the time periods. Time periods in the agreement for investigations, contingencies, covenants, and other obligations shall begin the day after seller provides buyers copies of signed cancellation and release of prior transaction is the default, okay? Or if checked, all time periods shall begin as provided in the agreement. However, if the date for the close of escrow is specified as a calendar date, that date shall not be extended unless agreed to in writing by the buyer and seller. That just means that, hey, um, if it's a 30-day time period, we're going to say, hey, it's all going to start today versus if it's a date. Either way, if we put like, hey, we're going to close escrow on March 30th, that's going to stay the same no matter what. Okay. Um, so that's time periods. Why would you want the deposit into escrow or the time periods to begin now? We want commitment from those buyers. So if we're serious about trying to get that commitment from those buyers, we might be like, hey, we're going to put you in backup position number one, but we want your deposit in escrow now. Just showing that they're like serious about moving forward with this property, not that they're signing seven other backup offer contingents or backup offer addendums with other sellers as well. Or we may be like, hey, we think this other buyer, it's a better offer. We decided to move forward with them, but man, I don't know. They're kind of squirrely. We would like your um, time periods, our investigations and everything to start now because we think they're going to cancel, right? Or you might be pre pretty certain they're going to cancel when we bring in this backup offer, right? And we accept it and be like, hey, yeah, but we've served them the notice to perform. I'm pretty sure they're going to cancel, but I want all your time frames and your deposit and everything to start today because we want to get the ball rolling on this so we can close in a timely fashion. That's how you would utilize the buyer's deposit or the time periods. Scope of broker duty. The parties agree that no real estate broker or agent involved in this transaction has advised either party whether the party prior transaction was legally canceled or if that party is legally entitled to the deposit. Expiration, this backup offer is attached to a purchase agreement or counter offer. It expires with what the other documents, it expires with that other document. Otherwise, this backup offer shall be deemed revoked unless signed and delivered back to the party initiating by 5 p.m. on the third day after it is signed by seller. Okay, seller signs, buyer signs. Any questions about that top half of the backup offer addendum? All righty, the bottom section, that's what we're going to utilize. If we have a backup offer in place, thank you for the thumbs up, Bree. Um, if we have that backup offer in place and now they're can our first buyer's canceling, we're going to move forward with the backup offer. We're going to utilize this bottom section of the BUO. Seller acknowledges being um, advised to seek the advice of a quali qualified California real estate attorney regarding the cancellation of all prior transactions. Seller hereby delivers a notice to buyer that all prior transactions have been canceled and released. Attached hereto are copies of the signed cancellation and release of prior transaction. Agreement is now in full force and effect and then seller signs. So if our first buyers have been canceled, we have the cancellation and the release in our hands. Our sellers are going to sign this. We're going to submit it to the buyers and backup offer position number one with a copy of that signed cancellation. Keep in mind, if we have a backup offer in place and our first buyers cancel, the sellers are required legally to move forward with these buyers unless the buyers no longer want to move forward or unless they have canceled because this date in section 2B has come and gone. Okay, otherwise they're obligated to move forward with these buyers. That's why I'm really careful about who I put in or lock into a backup offer because you're stuck with them. Okay, um, I or we acknowledge a receipt and copy of the signed notice of cancellation and release of prior transaction form. These initials by the buyer are not required, but it's always nice to have them acknowledging that, hey, yes, we're good to go. We know we're moving forward. Any questions? about the backup offer addendum form. All right, fabulous. So we're gonna use that to lock those people in. We're gonna hop now to the seller or the buyer counter offer. So remember our options with a seller counter offer are to respond with a buyer counter offer, okay? 
or to accept their offer. So up here at the top, that's where you're going to put the number in. Again, these are going to be sequential. If we have a seller counter offer number one that we're countering, this is not buyer counter offer number two. It's buyer counter offer number one because it's the first buyer counter offer. Okay. So you might have a seller counter offer number one and a buyer counter offer number one. Here's where you're going to put today's date, the date that you're creating this form. This is a counter offer to the seller counter offer or a seller multiple counter offer or other. So you're going to make your pick there. The default is just a regular seller counter offer, and you're going to put the number there. For the most part, these are probably going to match up your seller counter offer number and your buyer counter offer number. You're going to put the date on that other form. You're also going to fill in the property address, buyer's names, and seller's names. Okay, the terms. This is going to sound very similar to the seller counter offer. Terms, the terms and conditions of the above reference document are accepted subject to the following. Right. So this is saying, hey, <clears throat> we accept all the terms and conditions in the original offer that we submitted, except for the ones that were already mentioned on the counter offer. We're accepting those offers as writ written, except for what we've noted below. OK, so it's not necessary to put all other terms and conditions remain the same or buyers accept all terms and conditions on seller counter offer. It's already stated there. OK, um, so that handles that we've got B unless otherwise agreed to that's just saying that hey again the down payment and loan amount are going to be adjusted and stay in the same percentage if it was 20 percent down it remains as 20 percent down if we adjust that purchase price C is unless otherwise altered or agreed to um, the appraisal gap remains the same as well based on dollar amount so remember that appraisal gap stays with the same dollar amount so if it was a fifty thousand dollar gap in the first one it remains fifty thousand dollars based on the final purchase price <clears throat> um, other terms that's where we're going to clarify the things that the buyers don't agree with and that they want changed Okay, any other terms there? That's where we're going to spell out just like we did in the seller counter offer. We're going to reference the document here, maybe the seller counter offer um, D or section one D item one. You know, if they if they numbered them, if not, we would just put you know seller counter offer one D and then put you know purchase price. Oops, I can't spell either price to be you know five hundred and 1,000, because they counted us back at 500,000. Who knows, right? I usually will write it in, just so you know, I will usually also, if it's a price or something, I'm going to spell it out. So I'm gonna go 500, H-U-N-D-R-E-D, and 1,000. Well, technically it should be 500, 1,000 dollars. I usually spell it out, okay? So you're gonna uh, attack anything there that you didn't like in their counter offer that you're deciding you're gonna change in your offer to make it more appealing in the case of a multiple offer situation, whatever that would be. Okay, the following addendum, same as the count seller counter offer, we can attach an addendum and any other forms here by attaching these that it's got to um, incorporate into the buyer counter offer. The seller has to sign not only the counter offer, but whatever was included in part of this of this counter offer mentioned here in E. Expiration is the same. It's the third day after the date the buyer a counter offer is signed. We can tweak it here on these lines as well. And remember, um, if there's two buyers, it's going to be the latter of the two signatures. Expiration. Okay, so it has to be returned right back to, it has to be signed by the seller and it has to be returned back to the buyer's agent. That's what makes it valid. Or the buyer can withdraw the buyer counter offer at any time prior to seller's acceptance by communicating the withdrawal to seller and seller's agent and car form WOO may be used. Again, that's the withdrawal of offer form. We usually communicate it verbally or via text and then follow up with that form. Buyer's gonna sign here. And then we're going to wait for the seller's response down here on line four. Again, the seller has the option to either accept it, reject it, at which point they're not going to return it, 
or they could counter it. And they can counter it with either a seller counter offer or a seller multiple counter offer. So the sellers have the, the option of responding that way. Usually if my um, if sellers send the counter offer over, my buyers are gonna counter that counter offer. I'm gonna have a long conversation with the agent on the other side of, hey, my buyers are wanting to counter. Um, how, how do you think this is going to go over? I really want to work it out so that we don't have to go back to another counter offer. I'm trying to like not play ping pong as much as possible with paperwork, as much as I love paperwork. Okay. I really want them to, I want to draw this up in a way that I think the sellers are going to accept it. So I'm going to run all those terms by the listing agent. Any questions about this buyer counter offer? It's very similar to the seller counter offer. It just says buyer at the top instead of seller. All right. We're going to hop over to our modification of terms form. I don't know why I threw this in on today's training, but alas, we are going to cover it. The modification of um, terms is for, it's an MT form. And they've made the name longer than it used to be. Now it's modification of listing by a representation agreement or other agreement between a principal and the broker. So any documents that we have that are signed and agreed upon between the brokerage or us as the agent and our clients, they get modified with this modification of terms form. Okay, so that um, <clears throat> the BRBC, the buyer representation and broker compensation form or the listing agreement are the ones that you're gonna see the most often here are gonna be the ones referenced. Um, you're going to fill out the top by either marking listing agreement or buyer representation agreement or other. Make sure you put the date that that agreement was originally signed or the date in the upper corner of the first page of those documents. They all have them. Here's where you're going to put the brokerage name. Right? Here's where you're going to put the um, your client's name. Seller, oops. Seller or buyer names. Go there. You're going to put the property address in there. Assuming that there is one, it won't let me go away. It's now frozen. We'll just sit and wait patiently. There we go. Property address goes in there, is modified as followed. If there is no property address, if we're modifying like the BRBC, so there's no property address, we, might, may, we may want to write that in no uh, specific property identified, right? So we may want to put that in there so that you have that saved for the future, right? And we're, that we can use it in the case that we're referencing the BRBC, okay? Um, here we can change the listing price, the price range, the, lentil, the lease or rental amount shall be changed too, right? So if we said, hey, um, our buyers are purchasing a property up to a million dollars, and now they're talking about expanding their purchase price beyond that. We could change that here. We could also change the listing price here for a listing that we had for what was on that listing agreement. We might change the expiration date. Maybe we're coming up on that expiration date. Remember, if we're already in contract on a listing, or we have a buyer moving forward, our listing agreement expires, it actually will continue on through the end of that transaction, assuming that transaction is going to close. So you don't actually have to modify it at that point. And the same thing with a buyer representation agreement. If our buyer representation agreement is going to expire or set to expire and we're, our buyers are in contract on a property, it is going to go to the end of that contract, assuming that we put it into contract before the expiration date. So we don't have to extend it there. But maybe we're still looking for properties. We would want to extend that. Or maybe the property hasn't sold. We can extend that listing date. Keep in mind here, then if the listing agreement is an exclusive right to sell Carform RLA, that's what we're supposed to be using in um, our office at least, or a seller reserve listing Carform RLASR for residential property improved with one to four units, the renewal may not last longer than 12 months. This restriction does not apply if the seller is a corporation, LLC, or partnership. It is unlawful to record or file the listing agreement or a memorandum or notice thereof with the county recorder. Okay, so we can only extend it up to 12 months. If it takes you another 12 months to get the property sold, you may want to hand it off to somebody else. 
All right. Um, notice here the amount of real estate commissions is not fixed by law. They are set by each broker individually and may be negotiated between principal and broker. Real estate commissions include all compensation and fees to the broker. Keep in mind that with our brokerage, at least with Realty One Group Fox, you are in charge of your commission. You can charge whatever it is that you want to charge to either a buyer or a seller. You are in complete control over that. But here on the other terms is where we may want to modify that. Maybe on our buyer representation agreement, we said that, hey, um, buyer's going to have to uh, make sure that we're compensated a minimum of two and a half percent. And maybe the property that we put them on contract in is for two percent and we want to tweak it so they don't have to come to close with a half percent. We could change that here. OK, we could also change maybe the areas in which they're looking for properties if we specified that on the BRBC. Maybe we're specifying the on-market date for our listing agreement. So remember our listing agreement, maybe we had a sell in place, a seller exclusion from the multiple listing service where it wasn't going to go in the MLS right away, but now we've determined our on-market date. We would want to spell that out under the other terms. So we can use that to change any terms on either of those documents. All other terms of the listing agreement, the buyer representation agreement or other agreement as applicable um, remain in full force and effect except as modified herein. Uh, Daniel, this is called the modification of terms form. It's an MT form, but it's now modification of listing buyer representation or other agreement between principal and broker. So you'll never find it unless you just search modification or MT. It used to just be modification of terms. That's how it got its name of MT or its acronym. Okay, here's where your principal signs, that's your client, either buyer or seller. And here's where you would sign, you're gonna fill out your brokerage here with their license number, your name here with license number, and you're gonna sign it on that byline. Any other questions about the modification of terms form? The modification of listing by a representation or other agreement between principal and broker. All right. For any changes to a contract, thank you, Shauna, for any contracts um, that are between the buyer and the seller, those all get changed with an AEA, an amendment to the existing agreement. So that would be your modification of terms for anything that's between a buyer and a seller, right? Or seller and buyer, buyer, seller, however it works. Um, but anything that's between the brokerage and a client gets changed on this modification of terms. <clears throat> Um, those are the only forms that I have for you today, which is good because we're at 1152. So look at, I kept it under an hour. We covered again, the seller counter offer, the seller multiple counter offer, the buyer counter offer, the buyer backup offer addendum, and the modification of terms form. Does anybody have any questions about any of those forms or any other forms in your car forms library? All right. I hope you guys found this useful. You can log your attendance. Um, the link is in the chat box. It also gives you the option to make suggestions on trainings that you would like to see in the future. Thank you for your hand clap, Deborah. I really appreciate that. Um, this week we have coming up. Let's see if Abby throws it back on the screen. She had it up there earlier, um, but we have Tomorrow we're talking about um, presenting and writing our writing and presenting offers or writing and getting offers accepted, I think is what it's called for our buyers on Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock. We have um, the title company will be back in the office. So we'll be in office and via Zoom. They are bringing lunch for those that are in office. So they're bribing you to show up. And we're talking about the all important like taxes, right? So they're gonna touch on... Um, it's taxes and title, the different ways to hold title, as well as the different idiosyncrasy with taxes and how to, um, you know, help those elderly people in our community move and keep their same tax basis. So some good information on Wednesday morning and then um, Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. We're going to cover trend graphics and Symbium. Um, I may wrap in some other things there as well, but we'll see, but that's um, gonna be on Wednesday evening at seven o'clock. Anybody have any questions before we wrap up for today? Amy, can you um, stay on for like just one minute? I can stay on for just one minute, absolutely. Thank you.
Absolutely. Any other questions? All right. Fabulous. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'll see you tomorrow for writing and getting offers accepted. Have a fabulous day.